Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Balakrishnan Rajagopal. I teach in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And I'm also the faculty director of the MIT program on human rights and justice. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the continuation of our lecture series during this academic year on science, technology, and human rights. And uh, this is the third of the uh, lecture series. We still have two more left. Um, we had two lectures during the fall semester. Um, the series has featured so far during the fall semester um, Professor Rudolf Janisch, professor of biology at MIT, who spoke on the topic, Human Cloning and Human Rights, Promises and Perils. It featured Professor Stephen Chorover from the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT on the topic, Our Brains, Ourselves, Our Common Future, Neuroscience and the Struggle for a More Just, Participatory and Sustainable Society. Now we have the, today the third uh, lecture in this series and I will introduce the speaker who all of you know quite well uh, as well as the topic uh, in, in a short while. Uh, we still have two more lectures left. Uh, one lecture is uh, going to be by Professor Hal Abelson from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT uh, on the topic Open Networks and Open Society, the relationship between freedom, law, and technology, and that will be held on April 26th. Um, and finally, uh, a lecture by Professor Kurt Gottfried uh, from Cornell University on the topic science policy, politics, and human rights. Uh, and that will be held on May 3rd uh, of this year. Um, the series, uh, uh, before I introduce the speakers, um, let me thank a few people. Uh, first of all, the Dean for Undergraduate Education, uh, Robert Redwine, who has provided generous and uh, unstinting support for this series. Um, I should also thank the Center for International Studies, which is where the uh, human rights program is located, and uh, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, uh, of uh, the uh, Department of Urban Studies and Planning and the Center for International Studies jointly sponsored the program on human rights and justice. Um, I would also like to thank a few people who played a key role uh, in making, in organizing this particular uh, event today, as well as the uh, entire series. Uh, and that is uh, first our program coordinator, Susan Frick. Um, uh, our assistants, uh, Moshahida Sultana and Bill Masakwi, as well as many volunteers who, has, uh, who have really uh, generously helped with their time and effort uh, in this uh, series. Um, today's lecture um, is titled, The Idea of Universality in Linguistics and Human Rights. And the person who is going to speak about that, uh, perhaps more qualified than anyone else uh, at MIT and very few, certainly almost better than anyone else in the world, is uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who needs no introduction here at MIT and certainly in the entire uh, New England area, not to mention the world. Um, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky was, um, uh, uh, was uh, to give a brief summary of his uh, background, um, uh, was born in 1928. He received his PhD in linguistics in 1955 from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, he joined the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology here at MIT in 1955 and in 1961 was appointed uh, full professor. In 1976, he was appointed institute professor in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy. And uh, uh, his contributions to the field of linguistics uh, is so fundamental and stellar that um, I don't need to say anything really about it. Uh, his contributions to our general awareness of ethical and moral issues and public policy and foreign policy is also so stellar and so exemplary that I don't need to say anything about it. His publications are extremely well known. Some of his more recent books are, I'll just title, I'll read out the titles, A Generation Draws the Line. New Horizons in the Study of Language and Mind, Rogue States, 9-11, Understanding Power, 
on nature and language, pirates and empires, emperors, old and, old and new, um, Middle East illusions and hegemony or survival. Um, the range and the incredible complexity of his views obviously make him a prime person to talk about something that is so incredibly complicated as uh, the topic of today's lecture. Uh, following Professor Chomsky's lecture, um, we will have the pleasure of listening to Professor Elizabeth Spelke, who has kindly agreed to respond to Professor Chomsky's talk. Professor Spelke obtained her PhD in psychology from Cornell University and has taught in the psychology departments there as well as the University of Pennsylvania and now at Harvard University. Uh, she was teaching here at MIT in the Department of um, uh, Brain and Cognitive Science from 1996 to 2001, and she remains involved at MIT as a co-director of the Mind, Brain, and Behavior Interfaculty Initiative. Her research is on cognition and cognitive development, primarily in human infants and young children. She studies developing concepts of objects, space, number, and other people, and has authored numerous articles in several academic journals. She has received fellowships from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Guggenheim Memorial, uh, and Fulbright and Hayes, among others. And she ha has received many rewards and recognitions from the National Institute of Health, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. It gives me great pleasure now to welcome Professor Chomsky. About uh, quite a few years ago in the 1960s, I agreed in a weak moment uh, to give a talk with the title Language and Freedom. Uh, and when the uh, time came to think about it, I realized I might have something to say about language and about freedom, uh, but the word and was posing a serious problem. Uh, there is a possible strand that uh, connects language and freedom, actually has an interesting history of uh, exploring it, primarily in the 18th century. Uh, but in substance, it's uh, pretty thin and speculative. And I've, not surprisingly, I have the same problem today. There are useful things, I think, to say about universality in language and also about universality of human rights but that uh, troublesome connective uh, is still raising difficulties. Uh, the only way I can uh, think of dealing with the dilemma is to say a few things about uh, each of the two topics uh, with barely a hint about the conjunction, uh, leaving that problem for you to deal with uh, unless uh, Liz solves it in her remarks. Uh, well, let me begin with universality and language. Uh, the most productive way to approach the problem, uh, as far as I know, is within the framework of what's come to be called the biolinguistic perspective in the last 40 or 50 years. It's an approach to language that began to take shape in the early 1950s. It was very much influenced then by uh, recent developments in mathematics and biology. And the approach uh, interacted productively with a more general shift of perspective in the uh, general study of mental faculties, sometimes called the cognitive revolution. Uh, it would be more accurate, I think, to call it a second cognitive revolution, uh, which revived and extended uh, important insights and contributions of the uh, cognitive revolution of the 17th and 18th century, which really deserves the name, I think. It was regrettably had been forgotten by the 1950s, in fact, long before, and is still uh, largely unknown. Uh, in the 1950s, the study of uh, language and mind was commonly considered part of what were called the behavioral sciences, all aspects of sociology, psychology, and so on. Well, as the name indicates, the object of inquiry in the behavioral sciences was taken to be behavior. And for linguistics, that meant uh, also the products of behavior, like uh, texts or uh, a 
corpus uh, elicited from a native inform informant. Uh, linguistic theory consisted of uh, procedures of analysis, primarily segmentation and classification. It's both European and American, uh, guided by limited assumptions about structural properties and their arrangements. Uh, one prominent theoretician in 1955, Martin Jose, uh, hardly exaggerated in an exposition of the fields uh, when he identified the decisive direction as the decision that language can be described without any pre-existent scheme of what a language must be. And the prevailing approaches in the behavioral sciences generally were rather similar. It was very common to suppose that apart from some initial delimitation,